Hello and welcome to this episode of Brew Bottle on GGP Help TV. My name's Liam and I'm your host for the show today. Today's guest is owner of goldstockdata.com, author of How to Invest in Gold and Silver, a complete guide with a focus on mining stocks, which is available on Amazon. He's an expert on gold and silver mining stocks and a frequent guest on investment podcasts with a large following on Twitter, around about 35,000 followers. Dungeret is at the front of sharing information on gold and silver miners along with its macro data, which is an impact, uh, we, uh, and silver miners along with its macro data that has an impact on it. Welcome to the show, Don. Hey, thanks for having me on, Liam. Not a problem at all. I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. I always like to start with an easy icebreaker um, to start a chat with a guest. And, and as you're listed as living in Nevada, I wondered if you had a particular part of Vegas that you like to frequent or if there was something you would wanted to see or do, but not yet the chance to do. <laughs> That's an interesting question. Um, I actually don't like to go down to the Strip. Um, it's... It's a place I actually avoid, so it's kind of crazy. You live in Las Vegas and you don't want to go to the Strip. Um, but I haven't been to like the Raiders Stadium. I wouldn't mind going to, going there. I, I think it's called Allegiant Stadium. Yeah, I haven't been there. Also, they just put the sphere in. Yeah, so I hope to go there. I'm I'm actually thinking of going there very soon. They're having a movie there. Wow, where um, you can go and experience the sphere for kind of a low cost so those are kind of two things they also have a racetrack there's a there's kind of a lot of things <laughs> they have a, a racetrack here where you can actually go and s spend money and uh like drive a, you know a lamborghini around oh, a racetrack wow. yeah that, those are kind of the three things i haven't done that i wouldn't mind doing that's awesome before we dig into your thoughts on Greatland, I, I wondered if you could start at the beginning for our listeners who are not maybe so familiar with yourself. Could you give us a brief overview uh, on your past, please? Sure. So um, I worked in IT for 20 years and I retired from Chevron. And when I retired from Chevron, I started doing this website full time. And I, I, I was doing both for a long time. It was really difficult. Um, working full-time and then also the website was actually almost a full-time job as well so i started doing that in 2012 so i did that for about five years so um it was tough and then i switched over and i do this full-time now so i got into mining stocks um because i would I, 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 I was kind of a hard money person i always i didn't believe that the u.s economy was sound and i just you know, I just believe that you can't use debt to maintain our standard of living, which is what we've been doing really since the 1980s. We've supplemented our economic growth by expanding debt. So we've expanded debt faster than GDP. And now it's gotten to the point where we're pushing on a string where it takes several trillion dollars just to generate 1% of GDP. And I... I I've seen this coming. It's taken a lot longer than I thought. I, I didn't think that we could print as much money as we printed. I knew we were basically kind of behind the eight ball where we were dependent on debt. The thing that surprised me was the ability to expand debt and the, and the markets would let us get away with it. But I think that my thesis that eventually it's going to become a problem is we're there. I actually think we have five months left. I say we're, we're hitting a wall. The U.S. economy is hitting a wall. And once this recession starts, and I think it will start in the next one to five months, once it starts, I don't think the U.S. economy will restart. Now, a lot of people think that's hyperbole. It's like, come on, Don. So just a business cycle. We just have a recession and then we'll restart it and start growing again. But I don't think it's going to be that easy. I think the reason why is because the U.S. Debt to, debt to GDP is 120% now. And it's going to go up. We're spending about 18% annually increased debt. And that's it's just out of control. And so we're going to need to, to at once this recession starts, it's probably going to need at least $5 trillion to attempt to restart it, at least. And so that money, I think, is going to kind of, is going to break the system, if you will. Yeah. And so that's and when that happens, I, I got into gold and silver mining stocks because I believe that when this debt bubble pops, 
money from stocks and bonds will find it, find their way to gold because gold, gold is the one thing that has no counterparty risk. So you have now we have over a hundred trillion dollars in stocks, over a hundred trillion dollars in bonds. So all you need is about two or three percent of that money to want to buy gold, and gold will go to three thousand dollars, which is my target. Well, I'm I invest in this because I believe the debt bubble is going to pop in the U.S. and it'll probably pop globally, but I think it'll pop in the U.S. first. Not everybody believes agrees with me at that, but that's my expectation. That that's fair enough. Uh, thank you. So you started the website goldstockdata.com. Is that did that start with a couple of companies, or did you really expect it was going to grow to as 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 big as it did? Did you have a vision with that? Yeah, I did. So I, I started investing in juniors in 2004 and I couldn't find any data and there was no websites. It was really, really difficult to find leads. It's like what, what gold miners are out there? What silver miners are out there? What data can I find? It was, it was impossible. So I had to learn it on my own and with a lack of data. So the first thing I couldn't find was data on the internet. The second thing I couldn't find was any books. There were no books that explained how to do this. and so. I, I had to learn on my own, but I'm a writer. I've been writing since 1990. So as soon as I learned how to invest in gold and silver, I wrote my book. So I, I think I started writing my book around 2009, 2010. I think the first version of my book came out in 2010. And then after I wrote my book, it was like, okay, there's nobody writing any book, nobody created any website, so I created the website. So they were both <laughs> done out of need. And they weren't, but they weren't done out of trying to make money. They were done to, to help people to find data. First, you know, a book and then the website. So it's called Gold Stock Data. Originally, it was called Gold Silver Data. But my partner who, who, who does the, the website, he said that we need to get stock in the name so when people do searches, they'll find it. I personally... I would have stayed with gold silver data myself. <laughs> so we just changed the name around, I don't know, 2015 or 16 or something. But the vision was always to get the website big enough that it was comprehensive. Yeah. That, you know, if you wanted to find gold stock or silver, but so now we're right up to 860 60 names. And at one time we were almost at 900, but this last, you know, two year, I think we're three years now, correction, it shrunk. So yeah. now we're down to about 860, 865. I think it'll grow back to 900. But I don't add companies that have less than 10 million market cap. Okay. And there, there's about 50 more so that I have on my list. So we, it would probably be about 950 if I added every, all the companies I know I'm aware of. No, that's, uh, that's grand. This is, this is mightily impressive. So, so when you start to look at these miners, uh, what are the points of interest for you in your own analysis? Yeah. So. I, from the very beginning, the reason why I got into this is because I believe that in our lifetime, we will see basically this debt bevel pop and the U.S. Right. economy have a major problem. So if that happens, then gold's going to outpace any, any the cost. Gold will just rocket higher in a short period of time and cost won't appreciate with it. Now, no, I, have, I actually haven't found, I've been doing this for over 10 years now with my website, and I've never found another analyst that analyzes like I do. So my thesis is that gold and silver are going to rocket really, really quickly. And so I can, I can use estimates of future free cash flow, and I can use estimates of future cost. And then I can compare that. I can put a multiple on that free cash flow. We can talk about it with, with, with Greatland. I can put a multiple on the free cash flow and then I can compare it to the current market cap and I can estimate what that company is going to be worth at say $2,500 gold or $3,000 gold. Now I value companies at $3,000 gold. Most people think that's insanity, but I believe it's going to happen. So if my belief is that we're going to $3,000 gold, then why shouldn't I value companies at $3,000 gold? Makes sense. So, I, that's what, so I'm valuing Greatland at $3.4 billion at $3,000 gold. And I, I'll tell, I wouldn't go into why I do that. And so I'm all about analyzing a company where it's at today, you know, and if it is it going to make it. So I don't care about the next 12 months. The next 12 months to me is meaningless. The only thing the next 12 months is, is the company going to survive the next 12 months? But I'm looking out two, three, four, all the way out to five years. 
And I will go farther with Greatland. I actually go beyond that. Mm. I go five, six, seven. I don't really like to go five, six, seven, but with early companies that are this early in the cycle, you have to. And so I have a few companies that I go five, six, seven. Ideally, I like a company to hit its that my valuation, my target within three years. That's my, kind of my ideal. But some, but sometimes you got to go longer. Yeah. Um, but it's for me. It's all about current valuation versus future valuation and compare the two, see if the company has big alpha and see what the risk reward is. You know, what is the potential of the company hitting your target? And that's how I do it. Okay. That's, that's, that's grand. But with 865 companies listed, how do you stay on top of that? I mean, and this is probably what sets the difference between a sophisticated and unsophisticated investor. We have more than enough information to dive into and explore and understand on, on Greatland, but you do it 865 times. Right. So first of all, companies make in the mining industry, they make very slow progress. It takes yeah. a long time to build a mine. And so the progress, usually you get very little from quarter to quarter, unless it's a producer so if it's a producer, you get their financials on a quarterly basis, and I get that news. So I'm, I get a news flow. So every day I get the news flow, and I check to see, you know, which companies, you know, reported. And so when the companies are reporting their financials, it's kind of busy for me. So I'm basically plugging those in. Um, you know, if they've changed, if they went up, check to see what they're doing. So the quarterly financial is the hardest part to kind of maintain um, because it's changing every quarter. But most companies, you know, exploration companies, you know that. You know, they'll have a drill program, one drill yeah. program, two drill programs a year, very slow, methodical progress. And then if you're a developer, again, you know, it's very slow. You don't make a lot of progress. But I, I analyze every company once a year. Um, I have somebody that helps me to, to uh, some of the smaller companies, smaller caps, so that I can do, you know, 50, 60 a month. You know, I do usually do one or two a day. I try to do 50 a month um, and then I have some help to, to fill that in. Um, so, and I'm monitoring, I'm monitoring the companies to see if anything significant has happened, but usually from year to year, there isn't a lot of change, a significant change, if you will. Yeah. Um, and so if a company has a significant change, then I'll analyze it. But normally I just analyze a company once a year. That makes sense. That, thank you. Um, I'm about to go on a bit of a monologue, so apologies to you and everybody else who's, who's tuned in today, but I want to set the scene for my next question. When a few of the guys uh, and I started to converse with you, and, and thank you for your insight and conversation, by the way, we do really appreciate it. Great was very much a stock that was low down on your watch list. If I remember rightly, I'll be honest and say, I was at some times somewhat critical to your approach and perhaps somewhat unfair with my criticism. I really know very little about investing and hold no office to say such things um, to, to, to an industry professional like yourself. But I admit, uh, I'm overly passionate about Greatland, so I do apologize for that. Um, which is partly why I wanted to get you on the show today. Uh, because reading through your Twitter feed, you've been nothing short of patient and polite to anyone that questions you. So on behalf of everybody that you've educated, I genuinely thank you. Now, when some of the shareholders, and by that I can only really speak for myself, see Greatland, we see a company that's so much growth potential to become a, multi -mine, a multiple mine. This is far too early and I've not had enough coffee. <laughs> uh, we see a company that has so much growth potential uh, to become a multiple mine with a multi-billion valuation. Um, we're blinkered to some of the more nuanced points of investing in gold companies. So, uh, and I was looking at your April 11th tweet on the two prices to buy list. What, to someone who's years of industry experience and know-how, what makes a stock slip 70% over the last 18 months with fundamentals as strong as Greatland? Still too pricey to buy. Um, so basically that's the reason why I bought it is because it finally did hit a valuation that I thought was interesting. So before it dropped 70%, the issue for me was again, comparing is it currently valued at $376 million and it's dropped, it's dropped. So it was much higher than that. Right. So I had it valued previously because it take the one thing about this stock it had it, for me it had a lot of issues um so issue number 1 was this is it was a um exploration company so changing their focus changing you know pivoting into development where they call themselves 
a multi a company that wants to be a multi mine producer. That's a big change. And most of their company, their board and their management team, they have a lot of accountants. They have a lot of lawyers. They don't have a lot of mine builders. They don't have a lot of operators. So they're, it's hard to build mines. It's hard to operate mines. And so switching that DNA is not easy. So that for me was, you know, a real big red flag. It, and then the next one is the valuation. So I had them, I was valuing them before as a 150,000 ounce a year producer. So at 150,000 ounce producer, um, even at $3,000 gold, it still didn't have enough juice. I, you know, I want something that looks like a solid five bagger to me. And this one didn't have it. It was below that, that, that cutoff. I can find a lot of companies that have better risk reward profiles than previously before Greatland dropped in value. But this year, they, what's happened in a lot of times in these development stories is they make progress. Um, the, the, the actual project makes progress and the project starts to look better and it starts to look a little bit juicier. Now, for instance, Greatland, a couple things happened that made it more interesting. Number one, I really like the profile of the mine itself. It looks mm -hmm. like a mine that's kind of easy to mine. I mean, it's basically straight down. I mean, yeah. this thing is not going to be that difficult to mine. So it's, they're not going to have problems. The grade is good. It's it's going to be, you know, they have an ASIC of 650. I, I don't think it's going to slip significantly. It will slip, but not significantly because, you know, this mine, like I said, it, it looks pretty dark. It looks pretty solid. So that was, all, that was always a positive. But one of the negatives for me was, you know, what is the growth profile? Now, I always thought that it had potential to grow. And now they've been drilling significantly. So they have 80,000 meters to add to the resource. So I've expanded their production from 150,000 ounces a year to 200,000 ounces. So when I give them 200,000 ounces a year and I go at um, $3,000 gold and I, I'm using, you know, you know, I think I'm using 1300 um, all in. So that's $1,200 an ounce. I mean, that's, excuse me, $1,700 an ounce in um, margin. Yeah. That's a lot of margin, right? So when you add that in, I have free cash flow of three hundred forty million dollars. If if at thirteen hundred, so now again they're a six six fifty. So I'm I'm doubling that to as a break even, which I think is it, they should be there. They should be somewhere between twelve and fifteen hundred. It's hard to predict, you know, what inflation is going to do. Yeah. So I'm using thirteen hundred, but twelve hundred dollars is a really really good margin. So that interests me, right? I love the high margins. And then if they do hit the, if they do get to two hundred thousand now they're not going to get to two hundred thousand out the gate, but I'm thinking you know maybe it only takes eighteen months to get up to two hundred thousand. We'll see how long it takes them, but I do think they will as soon as they get into production. I think they're going to start thinking about growing, expanding production. I really do, I, because I think the goal is going to be there, um, and the payback is going to be fairly quick with those kind of margins. So at three hundred forty million. So I'm using a I'm using a multiple of ten. I believe that the multiples are going to be very very high for Australian companies once you get to three thousand dollar gold. A lot of people don't agree with me, but I think that because Australia is a good location, I think when once we get above twenty five hundred dollar gold, I think that you're going to see a big flip in sentiment where people want to own these mining stocks. Yeah, and so. When the sentiment improves, the multiples will improve. So yeah. I'm using a 10 multiple. And I think the multiple for Greatland is going to be 15 to 20. So I'm actually being conservative here. So at a 10 multiple, it prints as an 800% as an 800 return, an eight bagger. So that eight bagger gets my interest. And I'm like, okay, that's, that's, that works. Now, interestingly, right now, I can find 10 baggers all over the place. So normally I might pass, <laughs> interestingly, I might pass on an eight bagger because I can find 10 baggers all over the place. Yeah. Um, but the reason why I bought it is because what well, a lot of reasons that you guys are excited about this is I believe that you make your money on the second mine. You don't make it on the first mine. Yeah. And I believe that I'm trusting the company. They say that they're building a platform for growth. Now, that to me 
if they're saying, and then in con, con, and in, they were also saying that this, they want to be a multi mine producer. Now, I'm taking their word at this at face value. I, you know, like I said, I don't really like the board and the management team. I think there's too many accountants and lawyers on it. Um, th- those are the kind of people that make deals. You know, they sell their company, right? They don't build, they don't build big companies. I like, you know, CEOs that are, you know, you've talked to CEO many times, so maybe I'm wrong. I haven't talked to the guy. I, I want a CEO who wants to build a company, uh, build a big company, right? Build a major, you know, that that's where you make your big money. Like I said, you make your money in your second and third minds. And that's the reason why I jumped in because I, 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 I kind of, I'm, I'm believing them. I'm saying, okay, you guys want to build, you know, you, this is your growth platform. It's a perfect growth platform. The huge free cash flow, you use that free cash flow. They got 500,000 acres to drill. They got a lot of land. They got a lot of targets. I really like the discovery hole they have at Rudol, 18 meters at 22 grams. That, that's a mine in the making there. That could easily be the second mine. Usually when you get a gram meter hole of 400, that usually points to a 2 million ounce mine normally, 2 million yeah. plus. So that's a second mine. If they hit a couple follow-up holes, and that might not be the last discovery. So when you add the combination of you know the the free cash flow potential and then the potential of finding a second or third mine, and then you throw in the location where I think you're going to get a really good premium, and that pushed me over the edge. And then the final thing, of course, is you know they dropped seventy percent in price, so they finally got <laughs> super cheap. But prior to that, it was always a company that had a, had too many red flags for me. Yeah. The other thing I'm really not super excited about is is the number of shares they have outstanding. They have 5.1 billion. That to me is a red flag. And here's why it's a red flag is because when it's when it's that high, you can have really high volatility. Yeah, you yeah. can have it in the upside, which is great, but you can also have it to the downside. Yeah. Um, and so when you, you know, it's you, you go from six pence to five pence. It's a big move. Yeah. The real, the market <laughs> down, it's really big. So I, I would prefer a company that's at least 50 pence. You know, I don't like companies that are below 50 pence. It just, to me, it's kind of danger zone. Um, I agree. But I don't yeah. want them, right. And I do not want them to do a reverse split until they're in production or until they finance the mine. So that's a risk um, because whenever a company does a reverse split prior to financing, it tends to go down in value nine out of 10 times. So that's a risk. So we have these, you know, these risks these, that I see, but on the whole, I told you it, it, I, it pushed me over this edge where again, I, and I also told you it's a five for me, it's a five to seven, eight year hold. Mm. This is a long termer here. Um, and I think that this company could turn into a very, very large company. So they're, you know, they're currently at 376 million. I, I see this company could easily go to three, four, five billion if they, you know, if they build at least two mines. One thing I like about Haverion, I, I, I can't pronounce it, is <laughs> it's his potential to be a long life mine. And I like that. So this can be a 20 year mine. And so if it is, you know, they can grow on that. They can build on it. Um, so and, your, and your, I, your comment. Now you've, you've, you've touched on all the, all the points there that, um, that, that, that excite me and, and, and everybody else about it. And Sean very much is, and, and just to kind of go back over that, Sean very much wants to build that dynasty. Yeah. As, as, as we call it. Um, you know, he's he's put the board in place that um, you do say are, are deal bre- uh, deal makers, especially uh, Mark Barnaba and Elizabeth Gaines. Um, there's a few of the old uh, Newcrest Newcrest mining uh, guys on on the board and the executive side, on sorry non executive side, um, and they I think they've got I, th- I think that they they can't say that they have the funding in place until the feasibility studies released but for want of a better word the funding is ready to go it just needs a feasibility study to be produced and then they That's, can say they're fully funded yeah one thing on, on funding for me uh, what i found is whenever you have a quality project like this 
Funding is a non-issue. It's not yeah. something you, you need to worry. It's, it's not a red flag. That's why I didn't even mention it. But right. Go on. <laughs> no, that's okay. So uh, I think uh, checking your site it is still listed, and you might have just answered this, so please only graze over it if, if you have. Uh, do you still consider it the medium risk that you've listed it at? Uh, and if so, where would that risk lie? Yeah, I don't – yeah, um, yeah, I mentioned it. There's several red flags around this company. I mentioned probably, you know, three, four, five of them. Okay. So a company, yeah, I, I've i been trying to add medium low to my, I don't like to use low, low risk on any company. I don't even consider Newmont as low risk. Anybody, Agni Eagle is low risk. They're all medium. But okay. I want to use, I wanted to add a medium low, but I haven't been able to get my web web guy to, to, to change it. <laughs> I want to get medium low, but these guys wouldn't, there's no way they would be medium low yet. A medium low company is somebody who's producing and has a strong balance sheet and has, has lot strong free cash flow. It's the only yeah. way you're going to get to medium low. Medium is actually, there's, you know, a really good uh, rating. Medium, in my opinion, basically means you you should be able to trust these guys unless something happens you don't expect. To me, that's what medium is. It's it's actually, you know, it's it's a good rating. Yeah, no, that's good. That's I mean, that's kind of where we're at. We feel we're at with it in as much as it's the things that we can't control or we're not aware of that are going to make yeah. this right. The risk, that, the risk that Greatland um, shareholders have is opportunity risk. They're, they have their money here, and if, if some people are overweight, Greatland, they might not, you know, have the kind of returns that they could get elsewhere. Like I yeah. said, there's ten baggers everywhere I look right now, and so Greatland is a long term one. It's not something you really want to be overweight in. Yeah, it's it looks pretty solid. It looks like you're, I'm gonna you're gonna make some money here, but it's not in my top fifty list no. um, because I, I there's too many producers out there. Uh, you know, there's, there's too many producers out there that are going to do extremely well once gold and silver break out. Yeah. Whereas when those producers are just kicking butt, Greatland's going to be just, you know, kind of moseying along, if you will. It's not going to be, you know, racing to the top until this mine gets built. Yeah. So we got, we got, we got some time here to wait. Now, I, I have no problem waiting, you know, long term, you know, if this stock can be a 10 or 20 bagger really long term. I don't have a problem holding and waiting it. I, I'm that's my that's kind of my, you know, my strategy. I don't mind buying low early and waiting and getting paid five, six, seven years down the road. Now, most people are like, that's insane, Don. Why, why would you wait that long for a big payoff? But that's I don't have a problem with that. I, where else are you going to put your money that you're going to get that kind of return? Most people are long-term investors. You know, most people like during the stock market, they're in it for, you know, five, seven is nothing. Most people are in it for 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So for me to go five, six, seven, this is actually pretty short term. <laughs> the average, average investor. Yeah. Now that, that does make sense. Thank you. So, so Telfar uh, announced only a few hours ago is only making $240 an ounce. Uh, and Javier on not being online for perhaps another six, nine months at the earliest doesn't really lend itself to Newmont business model. How do you see the joint venture with Newmont working out? And that's actually just been announced that this court has rubber stamped that as a done deal. I, yeah, I just think that, that Newmont has to embrace this project because they're embracing Australia. I mean, that's the reason why they're buying these buying new is because they want exposure to Australia. And the one thing about, you know, for me, the sweet spot, this is, this is really interesting, but for me, the sweet spot for the majors is 200,000 to 500,000 ounces a year mine. It's pretty rare to find a mine over 500,000 ounces a year. They just, they just, you just don't find those anymore. So the sweet spot's like 200 to 500. And you want to mine it's in that sweet spot that has good cost that can, and it's a long life mine. That's what you're looking for. And that's what this mine is. Yeah. So, so for Newmont to walk away from it to me makes no sense. This should be right in there, you know, you know, right on their, in their strategy. Let's get this mine built. So I, I see Newmont, you know, considering this a high priority mine. I don't see why it wouldn't. 
It's in the right location. It has the right cost. It's long life, huge free cash flow. It just, it makes perfect sense. And so I, I somebody tweeted that, you know, the Newmont's going to sell this thing to Greatland because they don't want it. And I'm like, you got to be, no way. I don't buy that for a second. <laughs> it's, I'll tell gonna, you what. They're going to give away one of the best projects in the world? They <laughs> just bought the thing? I think, I think where that comes from essentially is Telfar. Telfar's a liability of like $500 million a year at the moment. Um, so, and without the free, the, without the cash flow, it, it, Javier on will be the project they want in 10 years time, not necessarily the project they want right now, which is kind of the thinking behind that thesis. If you, if, if you want, um, well, why can't they build another mill? If you're saying Telford doesn't work, they'll build another one. Well, no, the mill works. It's the mine itself that's now old and needs backfilling. Well, they, and can needs... It, they can shut it down and just mine, you know, Javier on. Yeah, well, that's that's what they need to do. But obviously, Javier on's not online yet. So, um... Well, right. Well, then it sounds like that's probably what they're going to do. If Telfer isn't economic, they have Telfer in their back pocket. They just shut it down and then put it in care and maintenance, wait for gold to go to 3,000 and turn it back on. Right? That's a fair, I mean, because, because, uh, yeah, I guess that's. So you're saying you know, Newcrest owns Telfer is what you're saying. Yeah. Newcrest owns Telfer, uh, the mine yeah. and the processing mill. It's, yeah, it sounds like a perfect fit to me. I mean, so what if they turn, if they, they only, if they used Telfer, the Telfer mill for Javier on, what, why doesn't that work? No, that does work. That's, that's what makes it such a cheap start, such a cheap uh, business case to start. Yeah. Yeah, running, well, but it's, it's, it's the mining part that's that's costing the well it's, it's occam's razor right the most obvious answer is, is what happens that's fair no i'm i'm yeah, I'm, I, I'm intrigued i didn't know i didn't know that that newcrest is basically losing money on telfer i didn't know that but now that you're telling you're basically you're saying the asic at telfer is like 1700 1800 yeah they just announced it last night so they're literally making 250 dollars an ounce well, no, two hundred fifty dollars an ounce is not terrible. It, 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 if the margin is to, it depends what the margin is. It, 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 so that means the ASICs about fifteen hundred if they're making two fifty. Yeah, I'm just gonna try and find that too because it it was updated last night in their two, quarter. Two fifty is not two fifty is not terrible. You you can keep the mine running at two fifty. It's at one fifty or one hundred where you start to say, wait a minute here. So because Gold is getting ready to to to, to blast off. Yes. So you, you if you have if your margins are two fifty, you're going to be patient and wait for gold to blast off. Because I mean, next year gold could easily go to twenty three hundred, and su suddenly your margins are six hundred fifty dollars. That makes sense. So they mind. I, I they really believe that next year we get to twenty two twenty three hundred dollar gold, and I, I and I think Newmont knows this too. So they're not going to. Well, that's my next question, actually. Um, but uh, just to, to qualify, uh, they mined 83,000 ounces of gold out of Telfar last year. Um, and that came back, he says, as he punches through the PDF. The head grade uh, is 0 0.12. I'm guessing that's grams per tonne. Yeah. And they sold, where's that all in sustaining cost? It was 1667. Was that USD? Yeah. Yeah, see, that, yeah, so that's terrible. So uh, what you told me, yeah, you said the margin was 250. That's not the margin. So you take the ASIC and you have to pad it about $200. Right. So it's basically 1867 So the margin's like $100. Remember I told you if the margin's 1150 that's a problem. So... Yeah, their margins are are really really so. Telfer's basically yeah, that's a mar that's a mine that they're going to consider shutting down if they can't get the cost back to fifteen hundred, and then waiting until gold gets to twenty five hundred dollars to start mining again. Do you you said they mined eighty three thousand. Do you know what the resources are, at Telfer? Uh, not off the top of my head, but there's not much left. I mean, they're actually going back through what they've already mined. To try and scrape that for the gold now. Well, this is a perfect situation then. <laughs> you basically, you just shut down Telfer and you use it for Haverion. 
Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty much a slam dunk. Yeah, in that sense, in that way, it is anyway. Listen, let's let's focus on gold itself. It's it's been presumed for the last few years, uh, and you've alluded to the. Uh, during this conversation that is going to go up over $2,000. Uh, but it seems to be struggling somewhat. And I've lost my mouse. Uh, and um, it's not really making any headway. Could you just elaborate your current thesis on this? Absolutely. So last year, so we've been in this correction since August of, of 2020. I mean, it's been brutal. You know, three-year correction. And I thought last year, um, not in 2023, but 2022, I thought in January of 2022, maybe gold could, you know, make a run. But it didn't happen because the stock market actually kind of caught on fire last October. So uh, October, November, December, January, the stock market was going up, up, up from all that liquidity in the market. And I basically said, "Uh oh, we got a big problem here. So January 22, I, I said, well, that was, I, I, I basically said, you know, there's nothing that can help gold break out here, except there's only one thing that can help gold break out. And that's Wall Street throwing in the towel and basically saying that we're going to have a recession. The economy is going to slow. And when that happens, you get capitulation selling. And that capitulation selling never happened. And it hasn't happened. We. You know, we, if you go back, um, we haven't had a, a big sell-off through this whole correction. We, you know, we were at, the S&P was at 4,800. That's where it peaked. We haven't had one big sell-off in that whole time. Yeah. Um, we went down to 3,500, but it was a slow, slow muddle down, slow drag down. But we never had that capitulation selling that really, that sell-off that, could turn the turn the tide, you know, into kind of where the Wall Street gives up, and so since we never had that, we went down and we bottomed last year in October, a year ago to almost th- this week. Um, we bottomed at right about thirty five hundred, and then we've been bouncing out of it. And so I've been waiting, waiting, waiting for this capitulation selling to happen, and until it happens. I was like, you know, we can just wait. I mean, and a lot of people, we kept having these rallies and everybody was saying, you know, we're breaking out here. You know, a lot of the TA people, you know, we're breaking out, we're breaking out. And I'm going, yeah. no, we're not. We're not breaking out. You relax, relax. You know, we're not going to break out until the stock market rolls over. And they basically capitulate and throw the towel in. Now, the, we had an eight-month run from October of twenty. 22 until um, this until August. It's eight month run. We got to 4600, and we got to 4600, and we rolled over. And I basically said, "That's it. The stock market is is it, it's done its final dead cat bounce, mm. and now we're rolling over." And so we have this struggle at 4200. So now, once we got to once we got to 4600, the 200 day moving average is 4200, and so. We didn't quite touch it um, last month. We came close, and this month we came close. I think forty-two ten, something like that. But we never got down to forty-two hundred. We never got down and actually touched that two hundred-day moving average. And then we bounced, and we bounced off of it. Wall Street got all excited. It's like <laughs> right now we're at forty-three seventy, and Wall Street's all excited. We're like, oh, it didn't break down. This is great because historically, the fourth quarter is usually positive. And usually, historically, October is actually positive once you get to the middle of the month. So Wall Street's all excited, like, "Oh, we got through the bad part. Now we're it's home. We're home free." So, but I but I'm saying that if we don't get a buck back above forty forty six hundred, let alone forty eight hundred, but Wall Street's got to get through both of those hurdles. They got to get through forty six hundred, which would be a higher high for this cycle, and then above, above forty eight hundred, which would be basically a breakout, a bull market. But if they don't, so we have a struggle here between those two levels and 4,200. Now, who's going to win? Now, Wall Street's like, we're going to win. We're, the bulls are like, we're going to win. We're going to win. And they keep using these arguments that, you know, the job market is strong. That's kind of their number one <laughs> one. But we haven't gained any full-time jobs in three months. And all they're adding is part-time jobs. So I don't think the job market is strong. The other thing they're saying is that the, the GDP is strong. The economy is strong. 
well, if the economy is strong, how come bankruptcies are on the rise? Why are credit card delinquencies on the rise? Why are companies complaining? Why are people saying that we're, the economy is slowing? You know, why, why are they saying the economy is strong when everybody else is saying it's slowing? <laughs> we're heading into recession. Well, yeah. These arguments for a bull market really don't hold water. No. They're, they're really cherry picking the data. And, and so inflate, the, the other thing that they're ignoring is a couple of really big, big data points. One is this inverted yield curve. You, yeah. you don't have an inverted yield curve of this massive size and then not get a recession. I mean, that nah. would just be weird, yeah. right? The other one is stock markets do not, do not peak before a recession, right? They, they, stock markets go down after the recession, not before it. Yeah. <laughs> so the stock, for all these bulls to go and begin thinking, oh, we're not going to have a recession. We're not going to have, we're going to have a soft landing. You know, the market's just going to rally, rally, rally here. The, the macro data doesn't support it. I, I, see, the one thing I like to do is, is try to, what are the odds? Are the odds in my favor or are the odds in your favor? Yeah. Well, right now, the odds are in my favor. The odds are in my favor that you have a recession. So I'm saying that if the odds are in my favor, the chances are that the stock market is not going to go back above 4,600. And if it does, it's not going to go back above 4,800. And once it rolls over, you're going to have to pray that it doesn't break down. Because once... Once it gets back to 4,200, I think th the first time it didn't touch it, next time it's going to touch it, it's going to go through it. And that's when the fear trade is going to kick in. And that's yeah. when gold goes up. That's the thing I've been waiting for. I've been waiting for this fear trade. And believe me, I think the fear trade is going to be higher than 2008. And it was pretty high then. It was so high then that it pushed gold to, to 1935 from 2008 to 2011. Because the fear was so high back then. We didn't know what was going to happen. Could the Fed save us? We weren't sure. But, but now we're going to see, uh-oh. And the other thing that's going to drive fear, and I think fear is going to explode, is that the Fed is losing its ability to control things. Mm. The Fed has always, in my lifetime, been able to do whatever it wants. If it wants to lower rates, it can lower rates. If it wants to raise them, it can raise them. If it wants to print money, it can but what we're seeing today is that the Fed can't do what it wants. And this is, this is going to be a game changer. It's going to be a sea change, a paradigm change next year when Wall Street comes to the realization that the Fed is feckless and the Fed is trapped. And the, and the only thing that the Fed can do is basically make the problem worse. Because <laughs> the, more they, the more they print yeah. to, to ignore growth, they're going to create inflation. And they're going to hurt the bond market. And the more that they lower rates, that's going to do it as well. So if they print, it's going to create a problem. They lower rates, it's going to cause a problem. Um, it's going to be fascinating. But I think that next year, 2024, and if we look at history, I really feel that in 2016, our political system broke. I mean, if you look what happened to like CNN and MSNBC in 2016, it was like, what is going on? It's like, you know, the politicians, you know, they basically said that, you know, Trump is not as an illegitimate president. You know, you know, I'm kind of agnostic on that. But just the fact that it happened, that our political system basically broke in 2016 and it's been broke ever since. And when I say broke, I'm just saying that there's no adults in the room. Yeah. There's no, there's That's no a really good way of putting it. There's no conversation <laughs> between these people. There's no no attempt to fix any problems. Yeah. I mean, the only thing these guys are good at is printing checks for the Ukraine. I mean, that's about, that's about the only thing they're good at. Well, printing checks to, you know, keep the economy going. I mean, not, not the economy, to keep the government open. Yes. They're good at printing. They're good at spending money. Like this year, the deficit's $2 trillion. But fixing any problems, they're just absolutely pathetic at, right? So political system broke. And then in 2020 with COVID, our institutions broke, right? We can no longer trust them. You know, who, who, who can trust our institutions after what happened with COVID? Yeah. And now in 2024, what's going to happen is our economy is going to break and we're no longer going to be able to trust the Fed or the Treasury to fix things. It's going to be three strikes you're out, basically, three dominoes that are going to fall. And I, that's where I think gold, we're going to, the recession is going to start in the next five months and then gold is going to break out in the next five months as well. And once it gets above 2000, um, and especially 2100, 
But once it gets above 2000, that will be the trigger for silver to come running until, yeah. believe me, silver is going to just race. Yeah. And then once silver gets above 30, it's pretty much game on for what I've been talking about for years and years. Um, this is going to be the, the epic once in a lifetime generational um, precious metals market where everybody wants to be involved. This is going to basically back to the 1970s type of uh, gold mania. And we're, we're right on the precipice of it all. Just getting so close, so close to it. I, I, I'm pretty much with you on everything you've said there with the, with the thesis. So thank you for that. Before I do wrap this up, because uh, time is, is, is getting on, is, did you have any questions about Grayland that maybe I could try and answer for you? Um, yeah, why not? Let, let's, let's discuss a little bit I'll, here. I'll, I'll, tr I'll try to answer as best as I can for you. So, because you know this story a lot better than me. So I'm thinking in terms of their pipeline. So do you see like two or like we have, we know Rudolph, they got to go and drill that, right? Do they have a couple other properties that you're like, yeah, that's a mine. And what, what properties would those be? So, so at the moment, uh, Sean was very adamant from the start that the last, the last place he'd ever get rid of is Scallywag, which is right next door. Because uh, obviously the best place to find a mine is is next door to a mine, and this uh, so Rudol, Scallywag, Javier on up through to this new Rio Tinto ground is all on this northwest trend. They, they they're still trying to work out where the source of all the gold is. Sean has said uh, this year where they picked up this new Rio Tinto deal that the new areas, I think it's Budgie Downs, looks more like Javier on than Javier on does with the work that's already been done. So we're waiting for those results to come out. Because at the moment, they haven't yet proved that, that, that there's any more gold around Javier on. So Rudel was the closest they've got to it. Um, so I think between the Scallywag draw results and the Rio draw results we're waiting for, they are getting closer at Scallywag. Hopefully Rio also shows that they have got gold down there. But yeah. at one or two draws a year, it's not the fastest of pro progress at the moment. Okay, but I once they... Ahead, Once they ahead. get that discovery hole, then I think you'll start to see more work going into it. Um, but obviously, you've got to treat it as a as dust effectively until they make that discovery, haven't you? Right. But, two, but more Rio, questions. Go two more questions for you. The first one is, there's certain companies that their DNA, you just know they're good exploration companies. For me, like Silvercrest, their DNA is... I mean, they started mining now, but those guys know how to find find silver, drill silver. They're just world class explorers. That's why I I own Silvercrest because I just know these guys are going to go find another mine, and they're great at drilling them out. Is this? That's my hunch. My hunch is that this is kind of a world class exploration team. Is that your your guys feel as well? Absolutely. And what what sets them apart from everybody else is is they. They seem to have become deep underground specialists. So uh, as far as everyone's concerned, all the uh, just below the surface mines have now been found. So if you want to find something, you've got to look much, much deeper underground uh, to, to find the mine. And that's what Greatland have have worked on using yeah, technology so and stuff. Right. So they, so, have, some, they have some brainy geologists. Uh, absolutely. And okay. so Ernest Giles is is the one that you're probably is going to be where the next full mine comes from. They've got proven gold down there, but not enough to go, we're going to make a mine. But they've just got the rights uh, from the local indigenous people to go back there after okay. five years and start re-drilling that. All and right, Sean, Sean's confident that there are a couple of mines down there on their only remaining last greenstone belt in Australia which is what Kalgoorlie yeah. is, basically. Okay. Okay, my last question. So I named my red flags. Were there any red flags? This is where you got to be transparent. <laughs> Are there any red flags I didn't mention that you're aware of? Red flags now? No. I mean, when you look through the history, there was a few red flags that we were completely blasé to. Oh. Okay, so the one thing I would think would pop into your head was infrastructure challenges. Are there any infrastructure challenges that they have in that in that part? Um, well, you've got the the rains that possibly come every 
hundred years. Like they've built the mine for a hundred hundred year uh, rainy shoot. Obviously, it's in the middle of the desert, so when the sand gets wet, it doesn't lend itself very right. well. So roads right. close and stuff. So electricity and water is not an issue. No, Telfer's got its own uh, gas turbine, which is and the gas is a pipe that was laid back in the nineties, I think, from Port Hedland through to Telfer. Okay. Um, and then so. Once the feasibility study comes out, that's going to show how they're going to get the actual, they're going to extend that from the power station through to heavy air on. So that will be permanently. Uh, and I think you're going to, you're going to see a lot more solar and other technologies being used to make this a very green and s sustainable mine. That's awesome. It's all great news. It, it, especially when you've got um, Andrew Forrest, backing Wailu, who's now our biggest cornerstone shareholder, that there is definitely a it, it's it's part oh, of that I, DNA. I, I'm sorry. I, I do this every time. I say I only have a couple of questions and I keep throwing no, no, them. It's totally fine, honestly. So I, I define insiders as anyone who's a large shareholder who is in it for the long term. Yes. So what percentage of those guys do they have? Uh not not many at the moment. <clears throat> the PIs have got too many shares. Uh, they've got Wailu and they've got Tribeca as their two cornerstone investors. Um, and I think what, you're wait what we're waiting to see is this transition over to the ASX. Um, once they list on the ASX, you're going to see a lot more investment coming in because uh, obviously they're mandated to... Yeah, but now it's too late. Once you get a valuation of 300 million plus it's too late to add a strategic investor yeah they can buy three four five percent but buying ten percent is an easy 30 million plus you might get a couple at five so this this is actually a red flag this is what you should have told me are there any red flags so the red flag is that somebody could buy them out that's the red flag that is the red flag that is a fair red flag to say but uh -huh. you um Wailu are known for not letting that happen. They they like to cause disruptions when the majors come how along. Much do, how much do they own? Ah, <clears throat> uh, 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 now you put me on the spot. I think it's about eight eight to ten percent. Okay, yeah. I don't yeah. know where I can find that information. So we need yeah. So we need two two of those guys, and then they can kind of shut down takeover attempts. Yeah, but I, I tell you, who's, who's I tell you, who's going after you? It's going to be Newmont. I, I think that's all it can be at the moment. I, I don't think be. that's who it's going to be. Well, <laughs> you think yeah. they don't want? You think they don't want that other thirty percent? Of course they I, do. I, I'm desperate for them not to want that other thirty percent. I want this dynasty to happen so that I can yeah, live absolutely. happily ever after. <laughs> absolutely, they're, but, they're going to. They, they could easily make a run. All they have to do is just start buying up shares. Yeah. And there's plenty of them, uh, which, uh, and I think the cons the consolidation that you spoke of, Sean has said that he wants between about four hundred thousand and five hundred thousand shares. Uh, sorry, million shares on the market, but they're very, very conscious, as you alluded to earlier in our chat, that um, it can't just it's happen. It's, it can't just happen. It's got to be done at the right time for the right reasons with the right yes. structure. Yeah, the timing. You, you you do it when you finance the mine. Yeah. But so, they're close. To, they're close to financing the mine. They're really close. So, yeah. Well, I mean, we've had this feasibility study delayed for a year now. Uh, New Newcrest decided that they were going to switch their reporting structure to. to you, know what, you know what? The opportunities they have is they could find a strategic investor to pay for their capex. Yeah, that would be good. That would be very nice. Wailu, I'm just checking. Wailu own 430 million shares. And they are the top uh, institutional investor. Yeah, about 8%. Okay. So. Um, yeah. So I, I, it, I'm, I'm still so excited about this project. Um, and it, it's the what happens next. It, it's Javier on his kind of that line is drawn it, it's how greatland then move on to ernest giles or the rio ground or rudel or scallywag and that's before you look at anything else that's that's interesting and exciting for 
for explore, exploration. Right. Um, so, but I think that's what separates the, the um, I'm going to say it again, the sophisticated to the unsophisticated uh, investor, because there are many things that I'm blind to and I'm blinded to by my belief that this is going to work. And I think that's probably what costs a lot of people, a lot of money throughout investing, isn't it? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like for me, like I said, the number one issue is opportunity cost and length, right? You know, do you really want to wait five years to, to get the kind of to expand, but it might be, it might be faster than five years here. You know, I said, because just the, exp if gold takes off and they expand production, at Javier on this thing could could really take off yeah absolutely so you know you get into production and they start talking about expansion this thing could really really take off fast so it might not necessarily have to wait five years for my 3.4 billion target could get there sooner yeah uh, and they always said this was a start of mine this was just phase one this was the start of mine to get the things out because obviously with having to get underground by 400 meters there's that's a the, lot of work that's the right that's the right way to think about it i couldn't agree more that's how you yeah. think about it so and then once that hoist goes in i think that's when phase two really starts to to work and when they look at stoping or block caving or any any of those bigger production yeah the, things the thing that's exciting is that once they get that cash flow if they do get it they have a lot of drill targets and if they and they're a good exploration team, so if they find something, they can drill the heck out of it pretty quickly. Yeah. And boom, stuck in mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it really, really is. Don, it's been a real pleasure to have you on the show today and thank you for taking the time to speak with us. Can I offer you this opportunity to speak about any current projects you may have or or, pe or how people can connect and follow with and follow you? Well, you know, anybody that owns any mining stocks, they, they definitely want to check out gold stock data. It's, it's, you know, I, I think it's a fantastic site for people that own mining stocks. If, if you don't, you know, it's, it's not really for somebody that doesn't own any. It's for people that already own some mining stocks. So it, you know, gives you, you know, access to a really good database to find more opportunities. But yeah, thanks for that. Not a problem at all. Uh, thank you for coming on the show. And perhaps we can do it again once the project has moved on and uh, things are shaping up. Sure, sure. Yeah, we can do that. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Well, that's it for today's show, ladies and gents. I really appreciate you taking the time to watch the episode of Brew a Bottle on GGP Help TV. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments section below. Till next time, my name's Liam, and you've been watching Brew a Bottle on GGP Help TV. Thank you.